Namaskar, my dear brothers and sisters, boys and girls, the love and blessings of the Mother and Sri Aurobindo to all of you from Sri Aurobindo Ashram Delhi branch. The devotional song that you heard just now uh, in uh, the melodious voice of Vitupal uh, says that uh, don't tell God that I have enormous problems. Don't tell God about the enormity of your problems. Instead, tell the problems that uh, my God is far, far bigger than you. My f God is far greater than you. You are nothing uh, compared to my God. That's what you should tell your problems 
rather than telling God about the enormity of your problems because uh, for God nothing is difficult everything is a small thing so ultimately it is the divine by whatever name we call him khuda or god or ishwar or paramatma it is he who is the ultimate teacher mentor counselor and savior who can rescue us from all problems provided we hand over our problems to him not as an experiment but uh, with total sincerity and in a spirit of total surrender the other day monica told you about how to make uh, anjara how to make asanas injury proof today we shall widen the scope and see how we can make life event proof and shock proof no matter what how we can still be happy because uh, if we choose not to be miserable nothing can make us miserable that is a freedom that nobody can take away from us even hitler could not do that from the jews and uh, that is what uh, made viktor frankl when he was uh, in one of the concentration camps and uh, he underwent hard labor he lost many members of his family but uh, when he decided not to be miserable he succeeded in doing that not only he succeeded he being uh, a person with a medical background a psychiatrist he came up with a form of therapy uh, which uh, now the world can use and this therapy essentially is based upon how we can be happy if not happy at least keep misery away no matter what the circumstances are if we can look at the situation differently with that little uh, introduction let's turn to the topic in greater detail using uh, the path my pranams to the mother and shurubindo ds program is a part of the celebrations of uh, the 150th birth anniversary of shurubindo and uh, the 75th anniversary of india's independence stress management is uh, a negative idea so why just manage stress it is negative stress management is negative in the sense it conveys the impression that uh, stress in any case is inevitable we should somehow make it uh, a little more tolerable a little bearable a little less painful but uh, why just settle for that why not instead fill life with love peace joy and fulfillment that is what we have been concentrating on during the last few sessions we saw what the spiritual world view is and based on that what the true purpose of life is and then we saw that uh, while addressing the true purpose of life inevitably we end up filling life with love peace joy and fulfillment and if we succeed in doing that then where is the room for stress and if there is no stress what is it that we have to manage so why not arrive at a state of mind where uh, the word stress itself disappears from our life we eradicate it and instead fill life with just the opposite however the mind is by its nature turbulent and uh, therefore we find it difficult to be at peace and for that we have to go beyond the mind because uh, something that is restless something that uh, is habitually Uh, volatile cannot be at peace it uh, needs an anchor you know the way ship if it is on the waves it has to be anchored to the shore and uh, the mind also needs an anchor the anchor itself should be steady like that nail in the shore to which you tie the ship so it has to the anchor itself has to be stable which is always at peace and what is that part of the being that part of the being is the soul so the mind therefore has to be anchored to the soul for the mind to be at peace and uh, therefore the key to filling life with love peace and joy is anchoring the mind to the soul so that uh, the mind becomes one with that anchor 
or another way to put it would be that uh, we achieve unification around unification of the being particularly the mind within the mind particularly the vital or the emotional part of the mind around the highest the best and the most powerful part of the being and that is the soul and that part is always at peace it doesn't know anything like uh, stress or anger or greed or hatred or any of those things which uh, lead to the turbulence in the mind it knows none of these and uh, when we unify ourselves around that part of the being the entire being the person is full of love peace and joy which the soul is about these are the characteristics of the soul not uh, desires and greed and hatred and so on now let's uh, look at some of the uh, common sources of joy in life and how the opposite of these can lead to stress we spend quite a bit of our time during the day in some type of work whether it is uh, in the office or uh, in business or at home taking care of uh, household work doing the dishes or taking care of children now all this is work how can we find joy in work uh coming to sort of the uh, what we normally understand by work say in at the workplace it has been seen that uh, the joy in work comes from primarily three things one is we should be passionate about the work we should really uh be very interested in doing that work secondly we should be good at that so excellence in the work and that can come only if we are uniquely made for that type of work or at least we are good at that work and uh, we have enough of uh, talents gifts and training to be able to do that type of work properly and if we have weaknesses and all of us do have some weaknesses the weaknesses do not matter at least do not matter much in the type of work that we are doing and thirdly the work should be ethical this is sometimes overlooked but uh, again it's very important because uh, say take the example of a pickpocket he may be very passionate about what he wants to do because that's how he makes a living and he may be very good at it uh, he is seldom caught doing what he is doing uh, picking anybody's pocket but then somewhere deep within he knows that it is not the right thing to do and therefore he cannot have true joy in the work that he is doing so what leads to stress at the workplace is the opposite of this no joy in the work well i mean so long as the work is ethical uh one may not be always passionate about the work the person is doing some of it may be just mechanical routine and drudgery and that also is a part of almost any work that we do uh so there may be no joy because of that because uh, uh it would be an exaggeration to say that one has a passion for all types of work nobody has that but then how can we still find joy in that work by realizing that uh, if the work is there it is our privilege to do it as an instrument of the divine so when we turn to the divine and uh, work in the spirit of karma yoga as an instrument of the divine uh doing it well because it has to be offered to the divine and not be attached to the outcome of the work if we keep if we are doing it in that spirit then one can find joy in any type of work so it's not always the work that determines whether you find the joy because some of the work will not in itself be joyous but at the same time we can convert any type of work into a joyous experience if we do it in the spirit of karma yoga then interpersonal problems the boss is not good the colleagues are not good and so on and so forth interpersonal problems once again seeing the people as a uh, a manifestation of the divine interpersonal problems can be solved instead of uh, criticizing them instead of trying to change them i uh, see them try to see them as manifestations of the divine unethical choices that is a difficult situation and uh, many people find uh, that they have to go on doing that in spite of feeling uneasy because uh, they see no other way 
they switch jobs and they find that it's the same story being repeated either they have to make choices which are unethical themselves or if somebody else has made them they have to sign the dotted line and uh, the choice is between uh, uh, being the hungry not being able to take care of the family on one hand and on the other hand going on doing these unethical things but then uh, people who are really determined always manage to find a solution sometimes they are able to influence others and change the system but more often than not they decide to quit and uh, do something on their own or join a place like an NGO where uh, they find that the atmosphere is far more ethical I know of people who have accepted as much as a 75% salary cut to be able to work with an NGO rather than work in the corporate sector I know people who have uh, started doing something which is very different from the work for which they were trained but uh, they bring some of their managerial skills into a new ethical business which they start on their own and so on so there is always a way out so much of the stress disappears when work becomes worship and that it does when we do it in the spirit of karma yoga when uh, people are treated as a manifestation of the divine and every event in life becomes an opportunity now these are the three basic things that uh, give us stress and all three can be taken care of if uh, life is lived in light of the spiritual world view if uh, we understand life more uh, meaningfully if we are able to look at life at a level deeper than the surface with which we are all too familiar and uh, which we get conditioned to treating as uh, the total reality what we see on the surface is real but all the same it's only a part of the reality and part of the truth can always uh, be misguiding so we have to see uh, as much of the total truth as possible behind life and beyond life to be able to uh, stay at peace that is what anchoring to the soul is about because uh, the soul has that potential it is the soul that makes us potentially divine and that is what helps us see life in a different light now living a life free of stress is not easy i mean all that we have talked so far which makes us uh, completely free of all stress and fills life with love peace and joy is not easy but then shorbindu has made a very perceptive remark in the essays on the gita that uh, the stressful life that people live that most people live is even more difficult is that is not easy either it is just that that is more familiar that is more common place that is more in keeping with how everybody around us is living and therefore it is uh, the fear of the unfamiliar that makes it uh, that makes us feel that uh, living that type of a life will be which will be f- full of love peace and joy is very difficult you know uh, and the word that he uses is that we are afraid of that rarer atmosphere you know rarer means a atmosphere with a lower pressure you know at sea level we have a certain pressure if you go to the mountain top the atmosphere pressure goes down now somebody who has always lived at sea level is afraid of going to the mountains in spite of all their beauty because he may f- he so accustomed to breathing air at the normal sea level pressure that is afraid of that rarer atmosphere at the in the hills so it is that type of fear that makes us feel that uh, in that uh, stress free life is very difficult in fact the stressful life that most people live is uh, even more difficult than the stress free life that is possible uh, through love and f- uh, through the, uh, li- looking at life from the spiritual point of view now let's get out of the way one a basic misconception that well uh, the solution to stress is meditation now that is uh, asking for too much from too little just sitting quietly for 20 minutes a day can't compensate for the tension and turmoil of 24 hours unless we change our attitude to the people around us and the events and circumstances of life 
Let's take an example of, say, the people around us. There is a story of uh, two women who were friends, close friends, and uh, uh, the children of one of them got married one after another, a son and a daughter. They got married. So the other woman met her after some time and asked her, uh, how is your daughter? Is she happy? Oh yes, she is very happy. Uh, she gets up whenever she likes in the morning. Uh, she has hardly any work to do at home. There are so many servants around. And uh, she never cooks at home. Uh, they order food from outside. Uh, and uh, uh, the, her husband has placed at her disposal a driver and a car. She can go wherever she uh, wants to. And uh, if she has nothing else much to do, she goes out shopping. And, uh, or shopping or to the beauty parlor. And uh, quite often her husband is also able to accompany her. And uh, she is very happy. And how about your daughter-in-law? Is she good? Oh, that's another story altogether. She gets up so late in the morning. She doesn't want to cook. She always gets food from outside. Uh, now, the story is the same, but one is the daughter and the other is the daughter-in-law. She loves the daughter, she doesn't love the daughter-in-law. So the difference is love rather than the situation. However, to be fair to the uh, these elderly women, Suppose uh, there is a daughter-in-law and uh, her own mother lives quite far away and she gets the news that her mother is not well. She's a working woman. She applies for two weeks leave and goes away to take care of her mother. Then she comes back after some time. Her mother-in-law is not well and she has to take leave for two days to take care of her. Oh, she keeps falling ill so often and uh, all my leave gets exhausted in just taking care of my mother-in-law. Now again the situation is the same. One is the mother for whom she happily takes two weeks leave and the other is the mother-in-law for whom she starts grumbling if she has to take leave for just two days from her work. So the difference is uh, whom we love and whom we don't love. So the difference is love. Now here the attitude to the situation is what is making all the difference and the difference is rooted in love and it is possible to love anybody provided we see the person as a manifestation of the divine instead of look at that person in terms of the worldly relationship that we have with that person. That is what makes all the difference. Now if you are not able to do that, if you are not able to make that shift, just sitting quietly in meditation for 20 minutes will not do much. I am not saying meditation is of no use at all. In acute stress, it can help us feel a little more relaxed. It can also perhaps give us a deeper insight into our problems. It can also suggest solutions to the problems. It can put us in touch with that higher force uh, for whom everything is easy. Nothing is uh, beyond uh, the possibility. In miraculous ways, the divine can solve our problems and we can be in touch with that more easily when the surface uh, has become quiet through meditation. All that is possible. But then, just to depend upon a technique, the way it is normally looked at, that if I sit like this and if I breathe like this and if I chant like this, then somehow miraculously everything will change, that is asking for too much from too little. Which means that there has to be a generalized change in the way we look at life. Meditation can be an opportunity for intensifying our resolve to live life in a particular way. And if that resolution during meditation has a spillover effect during the rest of the life, then yes, things will change. But to expect it purely from that technique, just because we sat down quietly for 20 minutes and breathed in a particular way and did some chanting or something, that will solve our problems. To expect that is asking for too much from too little. Now let's turn to an American psychologist, Richard Carlson. He's written this be beautiful book, Don't Sweat the Small Stuff, and it's all small stuff. Now what he says in this book is uh, essentially uh, that 
all stress results from the gap between the way things are and the way we would like them to be so stress may appear to be due to many other things external factors but that in fact is the root looked at on the surface we think that the stress is because of uh, uh, certain people certain events or uh, certain circumstances that is what we feel the stress is because of uh, Uh, the boss the stress is because the mother in law the stress is because i don't have enough money the stress is because of an illness the stress is because of litigation now these are the types of reasons we give children of course have other ways uh, other reasons for being under stress children are also under tremendous stress and apart from the rather too obvious when they are under pressure from their parents to do well in exams apart from that there are other types of stress also being compared to the sibling or uh, in school being made fun of because uh, they are not doing well in exam or because uh, they are from a different ethnic background or because they are fat or uh, clumsy or whatever so uh, they are being bullied by uh, the uh, friends so called friends in the class for all types of reasons so these are various things you know which can make a child uh, feel stressed but so children stress can be different uh and uh, that uh, in fact uh, makes uh, increases the responsibility of the parents in many ways apart from not comparing them with, with siblings etc one thing which is very important is for the children to understand that no matter what here are two people the father and the mother who are always with me and uh, people whom i can always trust people whom with them, whom i can always share everything and uh, establishing that type of a communication good communication in early childhood is very important because that is the time when it can be also done easily that is the time the child is forming a mental picture of uh, the world around and uh, uh, that is the time when the child uh, can either start feeling that the world is a very ugly place which whom in whom we can not trust anybody or that the world is a beautiful place full of good people and he can trust this world and that world view whether he can trust or he can't trust is largely dependent upon whether he can trust the parents and so the trust relationship of trust has to be established the communication has to be free so that when the child is a teenager and say passing through a difficult phase because of being bullied in the class or because of being in a relationship and then having a break break up uh that is the time when that communication that trust that was built up in early childhood comes in handy and uh, while this teenager on one hand gives the impression that now i am grown up and i don't need you anymore the child once again turns into that little child and is ready to share everything and uh, that's where he finds the first support system the most dependable support system so uh, the childhood stress should not be underestimated just it stress stress is not confined to adults stress can be uh I mean, children can be under great stress for various reasons, to which to us may appear all small stuff. But to the child, it is not small stuff, and this is important because uh, the number of uh, children going into depression and even suicide among uh, uh, teenagers is uh, on the rise, and therefore it's important not to forget that children can also be under a great deal of stress due to reasons which are quite different from uh, what the reasons for adults are but uh, all the same that is important to the child and if we reflect back on our own childhood we will feel that yes those were exactly the type of reasons why we were under stress either because we were being bullied in the class or because our parents didn't allow us to wear the type of clothes that everybody else seems to be wearing any of these things can cause great stress in a child or people around us have something which we can't afford now all these things can be a source of stress to the child and what can help here is an unconditional love from the parents that is of great value anyway so coming back uh, to the main thing what is stress due to essentially what richard carlson brings out is that st- all stress is due to the gap between the way things are that is what really exists and the way i would like them to be now this in fact is a very simple way of looking at stress but it applies to all types of stress 
and therefore it is of great value to think uh, to look at stress this way suppose uh, i want this much money and i have only this much money there is a gap between the way things are and the way i would like them to be or uh, i am i sick i am ill i have an incurable illness and i want to be healthy again there is a gap between what i want and what exists and that's why i am under stress or i want my husband or wife to behave in a certain way but he or she insists on behaving in just the opposite way once again there is a gap between what actually exists and what i would like now theoretically how can this gap be bridged let's look at this picture at the center you have uh, that individual under stress because uh, what exists is very different from what that person wants now one possibility is that uh, things change the situation changes so that now it is exactly as that person would like it to be so the stress is gone the second possibility is that the person changes and uh, uh, now the person is quite happy with things as they are so again there is no gap so the person has changed his way of looking at things nothing has changed but because now he is looking at the situation differently and therefore he is quite happy with the way things are so once again things are as he would like them to be although nothing really has changed so the stress is gone however these two approaches are not mutually exclusive uh to some extent the situation could change and this, to some extent he could change for example i want this much money i have only this much i work hard and earn a little more now i have this much it's not as much as i wanted but it's more than what i had then i work at the other end i reduce my desires so when i reduce my desires now the money that i have is quite enough to meet those desires to fulfill those desires so the result is stress is again gone so one can work at both ends so essentially we are working at two levels one is uh, uh, trying to change the situation if we can and at the other end trying to change ourselves so that we start liking things as they are now out of these two options changing the situation is generally difficult especially when it comes to changing people people don't change we may feel that if i reason with that person and tell that person why that person is not behaving in a reasonable manner it generally doesn't work because that person can look at the situation very differently and argue back and uh, give me a large number of reasons why i am wrong and in fact that person has an entirely different way of looking at things and that person is quite right so the person can justify himself quite easily and uh, the result is that the person does not feel the necessity to change and uh, people generally don't change that is a uh, usual experience and even in other situations it's not always possible to change if the illness is incurable it remains incurable or if uh, uh, i don't like the workplace i may not find another job easily or if i don't have enough money i am ready to work hard to earn some more but then where is that work available so there can be dif- difficulties in changing the situation but one option that we always have is to change ourselves so what it means is i should see things differently this is something uh, which uh, has been discovered and rediscovered so many times that uh, we have it available in different forms in different languages you know in hindi we say jab drishti badal jati hai to srishti badal jati hai when you uh, look at things differently the world itself changes or there's a beautiful couplet in urdu jab nazar badalti hai to nazariya badal jata hai jab nazariya badalta hai to nazare badal jate hain jab nazar badalti hai when you uh, change the way you look at things nazariya badal jata hai the attitude changes the outlook changes and when that changes nazare badal jate hain the scenery changes what looked like a dreary dreary desert turns into a green pasture just because you are looking at it differently now seeing things differently means seeing something positive in the situation now for example suppose a person is under stress because of Uh, because retirement is very close the person feels that well 
uh, after retirement, uh, the position will go, the income will go down to half, I'll not have any work to do, I'll feel bored at home and uh, nobody will care for me because uh, I don't have the position, I'm not earning that much. So he is fearing retirement. But then if somebody tells him that uh, all that may be true, but then you'll have so much time on your hands and you can do all those things which you would have liked to do but kept postponing because of uh, not having enough time. Now you can do all those things which you have been postponing so far. Now he has been given something positive to look at, something positive in this situation and uh, then he may start feeling that, well, it's not all negative. Huh? So he has found a positive, uh, re uh, something positive, some reason for looking at the situation differently and this sometimes somebody else can do because the person himself gets so accustomed to thinking about the situation in a particular way that he, that way of looking at the situation keeps reverberating in his mind and uh, he can't look at the situation differently at all. He gets stuck in that groove and the more he gets stuck, the more he feels that that is the only way to look at it. Looking at the situation differently means seeing the divine in others. Seeing the divine in uh, a person whom one does not like. For example, if uh, a, a woman feels that uh, my life is miserable because of my mother-in-law. Now, the mother-in-law is also a manifestation of the divine. And if she doesn't like her, it's not a problem, it is a challenge. If she can see the divine in this person, she can see the divine in anybody else. And therefore, this person has actually given her an opportunity to see the divine in everybody else. And uh, that is how uh, this person who was a problem turns into an opportunity. So she is a challenge so that she can see everybody, see the divine in everybody. So in Indian mythology we think contrast Ram and Ravan. It's very easy to see the divine in Ram. It's difficult to see the uh, divine in uh, the villain in that uh, epic, Ravan. It's difficult to see the divine in Ravan. But if you can see the divine in Ravan, you can see the divine in anybody. So it's good to have a Ravan in our life. <laughs> Seeing the hand of the divine behind all events. Uh, and one of the events uh, which uh, people find it difficult to handle is uh, marriage. Unhappy and unsuccessful marriages are far more common than happy and successful marriages. And when it comes to counsellor, the single largest category of problems that they get is, is that which is related to marriage in one way or the other. And uh, uh, therefore, one might say that, well, that is uh, one of the common sources of stress. But then uh, the person can choose to be miserable because of that or the person can choose to see that event also as something which uh, gave the person an opportunity to look at life differently, look at life at a deeper level. Because if that person had not been there, the person would have become so dependent on the partner that uh, his happiness would have been dependent on that partner and I have seen people very happily married and uh, all going well and looking forward to retirement. After retirement we will have so much time together and uh, we will be very happy. And then lo and behold a few years before the retirement or within a couple of years after retirement one of the partners passes away. The other partner is shattered because happiness had become so dependent on the partner. I am not saying that because of that we should not have a happy marriage. Even if we have a happy marriage, one should start thinking in terms of our happiness becoming dependent on something beyond that relationship. That is what is important. But for a person whose marriage is not successful and not happy, it is easier to discover a path which will make that person independent of the partner. So the person may continue to uh, live through that marriage but then the person lives also through that marriage much more 
happily not only because now the person's happiness is independent of the type of partner he has but this partner who looked like a curse now becomes a blessing because now the person feels that if this had not been my partner how would i have discovered that path in life that way of living which uh, makes my happiness independent of all external circumstances now one of the things that emerges in fact from all the things that we have talked about seeing something positive in the situation seeing the divine in others seeing the hand of the divine behind all events actually the divine enters all these three so in a way we are surrendering to the divine seeing something positive in the situation we can see it logically for example i talked about retirement but then there are situations in which no matter how hard one tries it is impossible to see anything positive at a rational level for example uh, a person has an incurable illness like cancer at the age of 40 he is the only breadwinner of in the family and he has two school going children how can you tell him that see something positive in the situation there is nothing that he can see positive in that situation logically however from the spiritual point of view still there is something positive and let's see how that happens and does happen to at least some people to whom it comes naturally in a few more it can be induced through appropriate counseling that is what the cancer surgeon bernie siegel discovered and uh, so anyway how can how do these people start looking at it differently firstly their attention is not focused on the disease what they feel is that well i have this incurable illness that is something i can't change but at the same time it is like an advance notice i know well in advance that uh, uh, i am not going to live very long so let me try and do all those things which i was interested in doing but had been postponing so far so build up a wish list of things that they would like to do before they uh, become too weak to do those things or leave this world secondly not only their attention is not focused entirely on the illness their attention is not focused even entirely on themselves what that means is that uh, they start looking at the world around them and uh, now they are more willing to help anybody around them because they feel now it's a, uh, now not much of uh, life is left let me use it as meaningfully as possible helping as many people as possible i still have something to give let me give what i have to those who need it not only that they start reflecting on life and feel that uh, uh, there were many minor uh, irritants which uh, led to strained relationships and they start mending those relationships uh, if they have hurt somebody they start apologizing and if somebody hurt them they start forgiving that person and uh, those people also knowing that this person now has an incurable illness a uh, change their behavior towards this person they become nice to him and the result is that the person starts living in a far more uh, pleasant and positive atmosphere and the person himself contributes a lot to it further what happens is that uh, within the family and the caregivers while there is stress because uh, this person is the only breadwinner in the family what happens in these situations is that uh, the children start growing up much faster than they would in terms of getting more mature and uh, the result is that uh, when the, if this person does leave this world because of the illness the family is uh, not only more mature and prepared to take care of the situation they also start turning more and more to that higher force during this period and uh, start getting influenced by the more positive uh, behavior the tendency of uh, this patient in their family to be very uh, easy i mean he is easily apologizing he is easily forgiving and uh, he has become helpful all this starts influencing the children and the other caregivers the result is that uh, he uh, sort of 
lifts up the consciousness of the people around him through contagion, through contact, without preaching. And therefore, the few years that this person lives, during those few years he may grow spiritually more, address more of the purpose of life than he did in several decades of so-called normal life and to quite an extent he achieves the same for his immediate family and other caregivers. So they all change through the experience, change positively and while they might suffer some physical hardship, some financial hardship, that is more than compensated by the fact that it was during this period, it was through this episode in uh, one person's life in the family that they all ended up addressing the genuine purpose of life. They took far more steps in the right direction in life than they would have in several decades of normal, so-called normal life. So in other words, uh, while I mean we can see something positive in some situations logically, there are some situations where logic does not work. And that is where the spiritual worldview comes in handy and we can always find something positive in the situation uh, no matter what. That doesn't mean that rationality is uh, inconsistent with the spiritual worldview. Our capacity to reason has also been given to us by the divine and therefore the spiritual way of looking at the situation positively includes the rational way of looking at the situation positively. But uh, a counsellor who is not restricted by looking at the situation only positively is able to give sometimes the client an insight which uh, cannot come by looking at the situation positively because now this counsellor has a much larger and highly expanded armamentarium. And the result is that this person can give that little nudge to the person who is a little receptive to it and in, while going through a trauma like an incurable illness, people also become more receptive to this type of a nudge. And the result is that uh, no matter what, the person can see the situation positively and if the person himself does not have that type of a tendency, the counsellor can facilitate that type of an insight. So, in spirituality there is no limitation in how we can see a situation positively. Seeing the divine in others, again comes to the spiritual worldview and seeing the hand of the divine behind all events, that is something which we are all familiar with, it is all God's will. Hmm? That is something which uh, uh, comes in very handy and once again is a part of just about every culture, we find it in every language. Hmm? Thy will be done, Prabhu Icha, Rabdi Marzi, Inshallah. So many languages, all, but all saying essentially in a uh, very uh, popular short expression that it is God's will and therefore we have to uh, reconcile with it. However, the surrender to the divine can be at three levels. First is surrender to the divine will. It's God's will and therefore we have to accept it. That makes God look like a dictator. He is all powerful and therefore we have no other choice. We have to accept whatever has happened. We can go a step further. We surrender not only to the divine will but also to divine wisdom. Because the divine is not only all powerful, the divine is also all wise. And uh, therefore if in its wisdom the divine has done something, there must be something good about it. If we can't see anything good about it, it is because of our own limitations, because our intellect is limited. Maybe time will unfold, sooner or later we will discover what was good about it. And that also does happen in life. If we look at something uh, which gave us a great deal of stress 10 years ago, we very often find that uh, we could not at that time foresee what good will emerge out of it. So that does happen. <clears throat> So that makes it easier to surrender because we have surrendered not only to the divine will but also to the divine wisdom. We can go still one step further. We surrender to the divine will and wisdom but then we say that we may not know everything that is good about uh, what has happened but at least I know one thing that is good about it that I also know. The rest maybe time will unfold. There is at least one thing good about it that I do know and what is that? That is, that all events and circumstances are an opportunity for spiritual growth. And therefore, 
there is at least one thing that I know so there is at least one thing that I know which is positive and that one thing which is positive in every situation is that every situation is an opportunity for spiritual growth which is the true purpose of life so that is how seeing things we can see things differently no matter what the situation is so some of the key features in stress management or rather total eradication of stress are changing yourself rather than the situation because the situation often can't be changed but uh, we can change so that we can look at the situation differently changing yourself means seeing something positive in the situation and even when there is nothing positive in a situation there is always one thing positive in it and what is that? that is that everything is an opportunity for spiritual growth or an OSG <clears throat> that every situation is an opportunity for spiritual growth is a potent infallible prescription for lasting mental peace infallible because it is so generalizable there is nothing left out and in fact truly every situation is an opportunity for spiritual growth here we are talking about stressful situations but even pleasant events uh, are also an opportunity for spiritual growth so we can grow through both so called fortune and misfortune so this is positive thinking unlimited without any limitations as Sri said in Savitri there is a purpose in each stumble and fall so the trick lies in seeing behind it and trying to see how we can use it. That is what Sri Krishna also tells Arjun that uh, this war is your opportunity. It is an opportunity for your spiritual growth. This is something that does not come in the life of Eric Kshatriya. Every warrior does not get that opportunity. <clears throat> now having a uh, seen uh, things from a deeper level and understood it now we'll turn a little more to the pragmatic side why the reason being that uh, sometimes you know uh, talking too much about stress in those lights in that light the type of light we have seen so far uh, and trying to tell the person that uh, uh, you can always look at the situation differently there's always something positive in the situation and uh, so on the person starts feeling that I'm if, if I am still under stress, it's all my fault. It's my fault that I can't look at things differently. Which means that uh, stress itself leads to greater stress. It leads to greater stress because the person feels that I am under stress because uh, there is something wrong with me. I cannot look at situ the situation the way I should be looking at it. And therefore too much of talk about stress which has become commonplace these days itself leads to stress and more so because the person is told that it is all your fault as if. But the fact is that we are all human, we have our weaknesses and failings and therefore uh, we may not be able to put into action all those things which we truly understand. We can always apply them to somebody else's problems. But when it comes to applying them to our own situation, it can be difficult for uh, most of us. And therefore you are not alone in this type of a predicament. And therefore if you have a stressful situation that you are going through, certainly you will be able to go through it more easily if you can see through it. You can see through it in terms of that wider vision which we have talked about. But at the same time there is no harm in turning to some measures which may not be that radical but at the same time can provide quicker relief. And that is what we call, we may call, is the first aid in stressful situations. So what is the first aid in stress? We can start with the relaxation techniques. Any type of physical activity relaxes us to some extent. And that's why we find that uh, uh, very often when somebody is uh, very angry, he says that I'm going out. And he takes a brisk walk and comes back and he is much more relaxed because physical activity itself releases those feel good hormones you know endorphins from the brain so physical activity makes us feel a little better 
However, a modern counterpart of it is rather risky. Instead of going for a brisk walk, the person picks up the car and drives it rashly on the road. It may help the person get rid of a little stress, but then he creates stress for everybody else on the road while doing so. So that should not be done. However, going for a brisk walk or undertaking any type of physical activity is good. And yogic practices are also physical activity and therefore they are useful, but they are even more useful than ordinary physical activity because of the atmosphere in which they are done, because they are done slowly, gently, peacefully, accompanied by a prayer and uh, so on. So all that makes those yogic practices even more relaxing than other types of physical activity. Then meditation of course is uh, a well accepted relaxation technique and there is no harm turning to it as first aid as well as use it for reinforcing within ourselves a deeper way of looking at the situation. Music. Playing music if you can, singing if you can, but at least uh, listening to music can again be uh, a very good way of relaxing. <coughs> Staying moderately busy. Uh, if a person is idle, then there is more chance to uh, ruminate on uh, the problems and that only makes us feel more stressful and uh, therefore staying moderately busy does help. As you know, we say in Hindi, Vyastraho Mastraho, Khaliman Shaitan Ka Ghar. So if you are uh, idle, then you will either be under stress or you will be thinking of all types of mischief. So stay moderately busy and uh, that will all keep you happy. Uh, while I mean that is important because some people may have too much time and that is what is making them uh, go into stress, the opposite is also happening very often these days. Some people are under stress because of being overworked and uh, that is again become an important issue especially among uh, young people, working people uh, for, who have uh, unrealistic targets to meet at the workplace and uh, they are more or less on duty 24 hours a day. Modern communication systems have uh, made it possible to work from home but it has also uh, made it very real that the expectations sometimes are that the person is always available and uh, is expected to respond to all types of WhatsApp messages and emails almost instantaneously no matter what time of the day it is. So that type of work, work culture is also making, creating a great deal of stress. However, realizing this, employers are also sometimes now turning a little more uh, flexible and uh, are realizing the value of the balance between uh, work and uh, not being actively on duty. So that type of uh, work-life balance as it is called in the modern language that is becoming more and more uh, acceptable. Flexible hours, work-life balance, these are also becoming a reality among enlightened employers. <coughs> uh, but then there is a person who has taken it to another extreme. His name is Tim Ferriss. He has written a beautiful book called The 4-Hour Work Week. Just work for 4 hours a week. That may look ridiculous, but all the same, some of the principles that he has brought out are simple. And one of them is, he says, try to sort of work out an elimination uh, sort of process. You know, the way you, uh, you know, try to eliminate foods one by one, the foods to which you might be allergic. So in the same way, eliminate from your uh, life those activities which are not absolutely essential. And that can always be done. So eliminate things from your diet. And one of the interesting sort of amusing points that he makes is that uh, uh, the one of the things he eliminated from his life was reading the newspaper. And he says that I haven't missed anything. If something really important happens, people around me are all talking about it. And then I don't know it. So I ask them, uh, tell me a little more about it. And they are so happy happy on one hand to find that here is this ignorant fellow uh, who doesn't know what is going on around and then they get an opportunity to t tell me something more which they enjoy. So that way I remain uh, uh, informed about all the really important things that are happening. I may be a little behind time but that doesn't really matter and I don't have to look at the newspaper. So all the time that I was spending on the newspaper is now being saved. So. Uh, 
one can stay moderately busy as far as possible but at the same time not be overworked help somebody hmm? uh, we should stay moderately busy but then if some of that work that we do involves helping somebody that will be more effective than other types of work because when we help somebody else then firstly it makes us aware of the fact that uh, others also have problems and that is why we are helping them secondly uh, we also realize that the problems that those other people had whom we are helping were much much bigger than the problems we had you know as said that uh, i was uh, under stress because i didn't have a shoe till i discovered somebody who didn't have a foot so helping somebody makes us conscious of other people's problems which are far more serious than our own problems and we start feeling the finding that maybe we are grumbling about nothing because we really have no problem and that's why we are finding problems so helping somebody actually ends up helping us there's a chinese saying that reminds me which says goes something like this if you want to be happy for a day get drunk if you want to be happy for a month get married and if you want to be happy for life then learn how to make others happy you make others happy when you help them if you do that that's what keeps you happy for life then expressive therapies find a way of expressing yourself be it through art be it through music or if nothing else write a diary just start writing down what uh, you are going through not only that becomes uh, uh, cathartic you know you find an outlet to ventilate yourself safely in secrecy nobody knows what you are writing in the diary it's a personal document but at same time you find that while doing that you also discover solutions you get start getting suggestions for how to, what to do in that type of a situation so expressive therapies are again very helpful the fire ritual if you are angry with somebody write a letter to that person write everything that you have in your mind give it a full expression but then at the end of it don't send that letter instead confine it to a fire saying that now i have forgiven this person when you forgive that person the person whom you do favor the most is yourself because staying angry is one of the ways in which you are handing over control to that other person the person is no longer around you the person did that years ago and yet just remembering that you keep on thinking about that episode those episode what all that person said what all that person did and uh, while the person is not around you you are giving that person the power to make you miserable through remote control why hand over that power to that person so forgive that person completely and sincerely and one of the ways to do it is to give it a physical expression so writing everything that you had in mind first and then consigning that paper to the fire with this resolution that now i have forgiven that person completely uh in fact ends up helping the person who forgives it has been seen that people who stay completely alone are more under stress than who live with somebody even that somebody else is a pet or for that matter even a plant if you take care of a pet or a plant even that gives you at least an object on whom you can shower love or a being a living being on whom you can shower your love so keep a pet or a plant if there's especially if there's nobody else with whom you are living even if you are living with somebody and you have a pet or a plant to take care of it does help because uh, these are uh, objects on whom we can shower our love but uh, these are objects that don't quarrel with us they have no egos and therefore it helps a lot and uh, they are also full of unconditional love if we can perceive it the plants grow much better as if the plant itself is smiling Uh, if you take good care of it and the pets the love of a pet of course is very obvious to all of us and uh, if none of these things works 
there's no harm in talking to somebody. That who is that somebody? That somebody should have a few qualifications. One is that that person should have a should have the time to listen to you. Secondly, the person should be a patient listener. The person should be a patient listener. Uh, not only he has the time, but then uh, he shouldn't have the time to uh, talk to you. The time the person should have the time to listen to you. That is more important, so that you feel lighter. And uh, this person should be able to keep secrets. It's not that you have talked to that person and then tomorrow the world knows what you talked to that person. So the person should be able to keep secrets. The person should have some wisdom to give you a little better insight into what you are talking to him about. And uh, this person should be neutral. Not only this person should be uh, your friend and well-wisher, the person should not be biased in your favor so that the person just ends up confirming completely what you are talking about. Uh, you are criticizing somebody and this person also starts criticizing that person because this person is biased in your favor. This person should be preferably neutral. Only a neutral person can give you that impartial, unbiased uh, insight into the issue which uh, cannot come from a person who is biased even in your favor. So talk to somebody who has all these qualifications. If you have one relative or friend who fulfills all these qualifications, you are extremely lucky. And if you don't have even one such person, there's nothing to worry because you have plenty of company. Most people don't have even one such person in their life these days who can fulfill all these qualifications. And that is why we need counselors. The, pro the counselors come into the picture and there's no harm in turning to a counselor because uh, sometimes, you know, in some societies, there's a great deal of stigma attached to going to a counsellor. People don't even understand the difference between a counsellor or psychologist and a psychiatrist. A psychiatrist is primarily uh, trained to uh, deal with more serious issues where the person has, is not in touch with reality anymore and that is what we call said that the person has lost his mind and that needs medication. So only a psychiatrist is qualified to prescribe medication. So that is a different story. It's not that anybody who goes to a counselor is mad or crazy. Hmm? Uh, just about everybody, there's hardly anybody in the world who has never gone through a difficult phase of life. A difficult phase of life in which the person felt that uh, on his or her own, the person could not cope with the situation. And the person needed a little help from somebody else. And that is essentially what counseling is about. One of the best ways of looking at counseling is a process in which one human being helps another human being go through a difficult phase of life with minimum pain and maximum growth. So what is the good counselor does is just make this person going through a difficult phase of life go through that phase with minimum pain, which means uh, as comfortably as possible and at the same time with maximum growth, which means this should be, the person, the counselor should be able to give that insight which makes this person go through this phase while growing as a person, while achieving spiritual growth. Not only the person going through this stressful situation grows spiritually through this episode by this type of uh, counseling, the counselor herself also grows through it. So it is a mutually uh, uplifting relationship. Uh, something which we can call another type of a spiritual partnership. That is what counseling is about. And uh, because it is difficult to find uh, a person with whom you can share everything and there is sometimes a stigma against counseling and uh, even if there is no stigma, it may cost quite a bit to have repeated sessions with a counsellor. Places like the ashram come into the picture. They end up being uh, informal support systems. Suppose there is an activity and we have activities like that, so like say the Sunday satsang. Every Sunday, one and a half hour in the morning, anybody can come in and spend a uh, time uh, in a peaceful atmosphere, listening to some devotional music and a spiritually uplifting talk. Now it happens that uh, a few people turn up for those satsangs every week, almost every week. 
So these people not only listen to or what is going on, not only participate in the activity every week, they also end up seeing each other every week. And when they see each other every week, some of them who are more like-minded start talking to each other. And uh, then they extend their stay in the ashram by also having lunch in the ashram. And uh, they share still more while having lunch. And the result is that they uh, find a counsellor, an informal sort of a counsellor, with whom they feel comfortable sharing all their joys and sorrows and maybe little, also keep getting a little different insight into their issue without actually uh, anybody feeling that this person has gone to a counsellor. So end up, they end up getting that counselling in an informal manner. And sometimes then they discover somebody there who can spend more time with them, who may be living in the ashram and can give them a still more insight because that person may be still more sort of geared towards helping, giving this person a spiritual insight into the issue. So that's how these places uh, again end up serving an important role in the society by informally turning into a support system where you get that type of informal counseling from like-minded people, the type of people who gravitate to the same place because at least they had something in common, which is something which may not happen within the family. And of course the ultimate counsellor is the Divine and, uh, and that is what uh, that opening uh, devotional song was also about. Ye mat kaho khuda se, meri mushkilein badi hain, mushkilon se keh do, mera khuda bada hai. Uh, don't tell God that my problems are enormous, instead tell the problems, my God is great. So turn to that counsellor. When you go to bed, uh, don't uh, worry about your problems. Don't treat the pillow as a pillow. Treat it as uh, the lap of the one who symbolizes the divine to you. Nothing will change overnight. Tomorrow, that ultimate will guide you. And you'll find no matter what, you'll be able to well. And if you can sleep well, that can be considered a good indicator that uh, you have to conquer stress. And for that, there is uh, nothing better than that ultimate counsellor who is also a mentor and saviour. As the mother has said, the best friend one can have, isn't he the divine to whom one can say everything, reveal everything? You can be sure what you say to the divine will remain a secret and uh, therefore you can reveal everything. In fact, the divine already knows but then you get the satisfaction, I have told the Divine and now that help will come. I am in touch with that higher force for whom everything is easy. And this is one counsellor who is available to all, rich and poor alike, at any time of the day or night, without any appointment. Now okay, let's have a look at a few questions. Stress can be relieved by <coughs> The way we look at people, events and circumstances. Yes, that is in fact the key to uh, getting relief from stress. Stress can be relieved by yogic postures and meditation. That is too restrictive. Both would help to some extent, but uh, to say that it can be relieved by those without any change in the way we look at people, events and circumstances is expecting again too much from too little. It can be relieved by yogic postures because they include Shavasana. Yes, Shavasana is a relaxing posture, but that doesn't mean that that in itself will be enough. Yogic postures because they involve physical activity. Yes, any type of physical activity uh, relieves stress. And uh, yogic postures more than ordinary physical activity. But then if one has to choose the best alternative out of the four, it will still be the first one. One can get rid of stress without yogic postures, without meditation, provided one is able to look at people, events and circumstances differently. But not purely through yogic postures, meditation or physical activity, if the person is not willing to change the outlook to life. So the best alternative is the first one. Of all the causes of stress listed by Patanjali, 
the root cause of stress is ignorance ego likes and dislikes fear of death ignorance ignorance of the deeper truths of existence that is what the reference is to here and we have seen that if that has been removed uh, that is what we talked about in the spiritual world view and the purpose of life if that is understood then all stress is taken care of because the others in fact follow from that ignorance the ego the sense of separation the sense which gives us makes us feel that my needs are more important than somebody else's needs the feeling that my opinion is more correct than somebody else's opinion all that comes from the ignorance of the oneness that unites us which is far more real than the separation that we can see so that is what the ego is about likes and dislikes now liking and disliking people liking and disliking events and circumstances liking some objects of desire for which we develop a desire now all these are rooted in the ego so from the ignorance follows ego and from the ego follow the likes and dislikes of uh, things that we like to have events that we would like to experience and people with whom we would like to be and correspondingly the events and people whom we dislike and therefore we would like to keep away from now all these things are rooted in the ego and uh, that larger vision helps us overcome that fear of death again rooted in the same ignorance treating uh, this life as the beginning and end of everything also being attached to ourselves as a distinct individual once again that is a type of expression of the ego sometimes we feel that well i am not afraid of death but i have so much so many responsibilities i have so much to do in life now that is only sort of trying to give good looking reasons for which are again based in the ego and uh, trying to sort of uh, appear brave while the person is actually afraid of death now let's look at responsibilities as we talked about a person having cancer uh he can be afraid of death or he can overcome that fear and look at it differently i also come across people who are afraid of death in the sense that they don't have an incurable disease which means that one can have anxiety because of the fear of something which has not even happened yet a person came and told me that uh, my father died of heart disease many other members of my family have died of heart disease and uh, i am only 40 i am i have two school going children and now i am afraid that if i also get a heart disease and i die then what will happen to them i want to live for at least another 15 years now nobody can give a guarantee that you can live for another 15 years even if the person doesn't have a history of heart disease that's first thing we have to understand because uh, if that were so i mean if heart disease is the only thing of which a person can die things would be so simple uh, now the way this person can look at it can be understood from a little story hmm? the story goes like this there was a person traveling by train and uh, he had some luggage with him including a suitcase a heavy suitcase and he had picked it up and kept it on his head so people were started laughing why are you keeping a suitcase on your head he said i thought the poor train is already carrying so much load let me help it a little bit now when we say that these children are my responsibility once again we are carrying that suitcase on our head whether we carry it on the head or we leave it uh, on the seat or leave it under the seat it is the same train that is carrying it so when we say that these children are my responsibility they are not my responsibility the responsibility has been given to me and therefore it's the responsibility of the one who has given this responsibility to me the responsibility is that of the divine who brought these children into this world i was only an instrument for bringing them into this world and this is a responsibility that has given to me if the divine wants me to live uh, to take care of this responsibility for another uh, 15 years i'll be there for another 15 years why 15 i could be there around for the next 30 years if the divine wants me to carry this responsibility but if not then the divine has no shortage of instruments nothing will collapse nothing will come to an end and in fact nothing really comes to an end children have grown up very well even when they lost their parents early in life 
so it's not that uh, we have to so it, we don't have to carry the suitcase on our head uh, while the responsibility is there we are the instruments of the divine let's do it to the best of our ability because that's a privilege that has been given, that we have been entrusted with this responsibility but uh, at the same time let's not be attached to that responsibility in such a way that we start fearing death another type of uh, uh, argument but i have so many things to do my project may like appear very important to me for example i speak and i write and i feel that i am giving such beautiful talks and i write such beautiful books and i have so many more to uh, write now what will happen if i die early nothing will happen many people have spoken much better than i do before i came into the world and many will continue to speak after i am dead and gone hmm? and the world is full of uh, millions of excellent books much better than i write so whether i write uh, die after writing 20 books or i die after writing 25 books will make absolutely no difference to the world excellent books have been produced in the past and they'll continue to getting produced it makes no difference to the world then why do i speak and write because while i am there this is what i feel that uh, i have been given uh, and therefore those who seem to need it i can go on giving it to them till i can but at the same time that is fulfilling the purpose of my life so it basically once again it boils down to a self centered pursuit that is what spirituality is so i am fulfilling the purpose of my life by doing what i am doing but to the world whether i am there or not it makes no difference it is up to the divine who is entrusted me with this responsibility now by making me feel that this is what i should be doing and therefore i am doing it and when the divine feels that this instrument is now worn out and uh, it needs to be replaced the way you know factory manager decides this model has now grown too old let me get rid of this machine get another one its place so it is up to the divine and all it takes is one little clot which will travel somewhere from my leg or somewhere and get into the uh, lungs or the brain and collapsed enough you have spoken enough you have written enough uh, another new instruments are ready to take over so that's what will happen so have to be prepared for that so fear of death arises once again from that same ignorance and from which issues the ego which makes the person it's my responsibility it is my project how will it continue if i go everything will continue the world will not come to an end okay so that's how one can see that all these sources of stress which patanjali lists you know avidya asmita raga dvesha abhinivesha klesha hmm? avidya ignorance asmita ego raga dvesha likes and dislikes abhinivesha fear of death these are root causes of stress according to patanjali and they all rooted basically in ignorance which means the spiritual world view not only understood but also applied in life there is a big gap between knowing and being able to use it in life but all the same it is the ultimate solution to all stress so the root cause of stress according to patanjali is ignorance the rest follow from it acute stress may be relieved to some extent not only to some extent by meditation yes by jogging it's a physical activity yes by helping somebody yes all of the above so all of the above is the right answer but none of these by itself will be a total solution will not eradicate stress to some extent yes stress may be relieved by all of the above okay. again uh, these two are uh, inexhaustible sources for uh, living a life that is full of love peace and joy and for eradicating stress the life divine and savitri the two books which may be considered upanishads in the english language and in this book understanding spirituality this forms chapter 3 which is again a pretty long chapter about uh, 50 pages and in this one again there is a pretty long chapter on stress titled don't worry be happy back to health through yoga and in veda of the body by dr alok pande another excellent uh, collection of a few chapters and of course quite a bit is scattered throughout the book but specially concentrated uh, matter on stress management from pages 199 through 224 about 25 pages on stress management 
and in this book spiritual wisdom in small doses you will find short one to two page essays on just about everything related to stress like positive thinking psychology stress stress management etc <clears throat> gratitude to the mother and shorobindo for making it all possible and thank you all for listening Uh, namaste bhaiya um, i have a comment and then i have a question for aditi uh, so um, first of all it was a great revision the last couple of sessions uh, i remember uh, when i did the yoga course in 2018 uh, and especially the sessions on spiritual world view the purpose of life and finally the stress management um, we experienced a sense of contagion uh, there in the collective and after ever since we experienced it over and over again because we were operating in that spirit and um, so thank you for that uh, my question is to aditi aditi uh, you lay a lot of emphasis on uh, inner experience and purity of aspiration and in your role as a counselor you uh, sincerely try to offer that and you know you say you talk about experiencing in silence and you know expression and freedom and what what bhaiya talked about the attributes of a good counselor would you want to share your views on that in your own experience in the last 20 years thank you छोटा सा slowly trying to turn in and see what is your role in the situation so in any interaction there are three things involved people situation and you so it's an interchange and an interaction between these three things so just placing everything at the right spectrum for them and just letting them watch it in silence it helps a lot to kind of sort things to begin with so that is how i look at it would you like to answer I uh, know I think uh, that's uh, good uh, any other questions does anybody else have any questions in the chat box uh, how to manage stress due to deadlines can we really avoid it yes sir. how to avoid stress due to deadlines that is one of the categories of stress that is becoming very common in the corporate sector by having a deadline which is difficult to meet by having a target which is difficult to meet uh, it's considered that you are challenging the person and therefore the person will uh, do his best uh, i think once again a little more enlightened view among the employers is what is important uh, in the sense that uh, while i mean it is important to have a little bit of challenge uh, but challenge beyond a certain point becomes frustrating you know uh, that applies to stress in general it follows that inverted u shaped curve in that at a certain level of stress you are at your optimum performance if one is too relaxed then again the performance falls if there is too much stress then again the performance declines so one doesn't have to take that stress beyond a certain point and uh, if uh, the employer doesn't understand the employee has to make it understood so which means that one should not be afraid of making that understood that this is an unrealistic deadline uh and also uh, employers have to understand and otherwise the employees have to make them understood and uh, make them understand that uh, uh if the person is a little more relaxed seems to have a little less work than the person can actually do that time apparently for doing nothing is the time when all types of innovative ideas come that is the time you are at your most creative and uh, if your head is always cluttered with concrete things the immediately to be done and w- within this much time to be done and so much to be done if the one is preoccupied with all those very concrete uh, material measurable details then there's no room left for the mind to ruminate which is necessary for uh, being creative and innovative and eventually what makes companies progress is not just uh, meeting the targets and deadlines but uh, what brings about uh, phenomenal growth is 
a few creative and innovative innovative ideas which should keep coming from time to time it is the, the those ideas also need a, uh, to keep coming continuously and have a fast turnover Hello. Oh, I don't have any. Oh, sorry. sorry. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, thanks. Uh, good morning, Dr. Ramesh. Good morning. Uh, so, so we have a lot of uh, uh, issues coming uh, with the siblings. I mean, um, uh, the siblings want the other siblings to solve their problem. You know, you know usually it doesn't work. Because the another sibling is not the right person to counsel. Uh, so how do we make them go to a counselor? Because uh, I face with this problem. I have two sisters who have some issues, but they refuse to go to a counselor. Yes, that's uh, a good question. I mean, in case of grown-up uh, persons like you, can I uh, uh, just uh, stop you for a minute? One, one is that uh, st uh, the first topic you said about this mother-in-law, daughter-in-law issue in the house. The other one is um, having uh, feeling a little uh, depressed because they don't have issues, uh, they don't have kids, and they feel very lonely. They expect our children to go and visit them, but the younger kids do no more. They don't do, they have their own life. Yes, in case of grown-up persons like you, siblings can be good counsellors to each other. Uh, in some -ish cases, uh, they may prove inadequate because of being biased. They are not neutral. So, say, I mean, if there is a, a mother-in-law, daughter-in-law issue, then uh, naturally you are, can't be totally neutral. You will look at it more from your sister's point of view. So you are not totally neutral. That is what comes in the way. The second thing, not having an issue. Uh, to that, I mean, the spiritual solution is again sort of going beyond uh, uh, this uh, necessity for a, a biological child. The uh, spiritual solution would be adoption. That uh, yeah, it has its own limitation. Mm -hmm. They should uh, adoption. I think needs. Uh, them to be a little more younger, the parents. One can adopt a little older child if the parents are not very young. One can adopt a little older child. Of course, the younger the better when one adopts, but even older children can be adopted and uh, uh, they are helpful both for its uh, sort of uh, at least gives the adopted child a much better life. And for the parents, again, uh, somebody on whom they can shower their love and affection and see the child grow and bloom. So adoption would be the solution. And because you are adopting a little older child, that head start is already there. The child will be quite grown up by the time the couple is old. Thank you, sir. Everything is okay for me. I don't have any question. I think it's a mistake. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So if there are no more questions, we come to the end of the session. And uh, just because we are having some problem with our uh, email ID as well as YouTube channel, I will write down an alternative email in the chat box. So if you want to communicate, you can write to that email ID. And we are hoping to be back with a solution by next week. And that will be the end of the session today. And our next class will be on Monday. The topic will be integral education. Thank you, everyone.